What is up, theology nerds? This is the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast, and let me just tell you right now, right now, uh, this is this is an amazing episode. This is a crossover episode, you could say. This is an episode in which the good Dr. Daniel Kirk of LectioCast fame joins Homebrewed Christianity as we discuss his new book, A Man Attested by God. And uh, no, it's not an autobiography. It's about <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> How are you doing, Nathan? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. Just doing the whole like not sleeping that much. <sighs> gotta love, to, gotta love young children. Having a, you know? having an infant, doing final edits on my dissertation. And, so nothing. You're not up to much lately. Nah, guess. nah. <laughs> yeah, just uh, coming up with you know creative ways of timing caffeine application. Yep. You know, gotta gotta use it at peak hours. There, you don't want to waste it. Mm-hmm. I wonder what uh, intro music we're going to get for this. I wonder if it's going to be like some weird like remix between the Lectio cast and the homebrew music. I don't know. We'll find out. I don't know. I don't know. But um, look, look, homebrew Christianity listeners. I want to tell you a few things before we get into this. One, Daniel's book is really good. A man attested by God. Yeah. If you don't have it, you should uh, you should get it because you know he every week he puts out a lectionary podcast telling the people. About the lectionary text, trying to help you um, have have some good good material as you start your sermon prep or your discussion group or where you're just in the car and you say to yourself, you know, so what if my, my fundamentalist family members are praying for my salvation? I'm going to listen to a Bible podcast and I'm going to show them what's up. And then you do. And the good Dr. Daniel Kirk, which I don't know if he, I, don't, I haven't yet to find out if he likes me calling him the good Dr. Daniel Kirk, but I, I think, think he should does. Stick. I think he does. He should stick. I th- um, doesn't he use it sometimes? I, I yeah, but I don't know if it's because I added mm, it to his mm, graphic. Mm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the original LectioCast graphic did not. Does it have say the "Man Tested by God" by the good Doctor Daniel Kirk? No, no, that would be Erdman's did not put it on the front of the book. <laughs> if they, if that had been on the front of the book, sales would have blown off the wall. There you go. Um, anyway, uh, it's it's a great book about God and Jesus and the the, the early church. In in the New Testament, maybe Christologies weren't all, as high as uh, some people seem to as think. some people seem to think. Especially the evangelicals who did not find um, did not find his Christology appropriately high mm. to be having encounters with forming young minds mm. when they read the Bible. Well, there you go. But I think I think he's great for your mind. <laughs> I can't um, wait to finish reading it. So um, yeah, we're going to talk about Jesus. The book's great, um, and and then. I just want to tell you two other things. One, Theology Beer Camp this summer. What? It is happening in August in Oklahoma City and in um, Denver, Colorado. Denver, Colorado. And so you need to go to theologybeercamp.com, get the info, and get your tickets because there's going to be lots of tasty tasty beer, lots oh, of nerdiness. Oh, a lot of beer. Yeah. A you, lot of really, really good beer. If you haven't seen the um, – there's a special a – special, uh, what are they called? Tumblr page. We have a Tumblr page. That's just for the Theology Beer Camp stuff this summer. And on the Tumblr page, you can already see all these breweries that are sponsoring or supporting or donating beer and stuff for the yeah, festivities. Yeah, good stuff. It's going to be... It, what better place to, like, nerd out and to have... With your beer out. Yeah. With, uh, with, with high-quality craft beverages. So it's going to be awesome. Go there. Find details. Theologybeercamp.com. Um, if you want it to come to your city, come to your area... Then you can also, when you go to the website, click and say, like, here's where I live. It should go Cast there. Cast your vote. Yeah, because we're just trying to bring it to the peoples. Um, we're democratic that way, you know? Oh, just, yeah. We just want to listen to everyone's voice and and decide which place we like the best and then go. <laughs> because just because a city has a lot of podcast listeners in it doesn't mean it has a lot of podcast listeners who want to day drink for two days. That is correct. While we have super nerdy talks. This is true. That's and and you don't know if they're ready to like have a cornhole battle, or to have karaoke at night, or whatnot. Like you, only 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 the right listeners That's are right. ready for that. That's right. So so if you're one of them, go to the website. Tell and us. Tell us because we want to come there next. Wherever you are. Wherever you are. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is that if you are a youth minister. And later this spring, we have a free youth ministry class that our friends at the Center for Process Studies are uh, putting together with us. It's on open and relational youth ministry. So if you're into open and relational theology, 
Maybe you're a process person. Maybe you're a social uh, Trinitarian molten moniite. Mm. Maybe you are an uh, open theist of sorts. But if you're into open and relational theology, namely that theology is loving, God's love, and it's built in relationships, then you should sign up for the class. You can text Open Youth without a space to 44222. Yep, that's it. Oh, yeah. I heard someone else on another podcast do, like, oh, if you text this word to this number, you get it. And it was some combination of fours and twos. And it was very confusing because I, I only know ours. Well, so I got, so just make sure you get it right. Four, four, two, two, two. Yeah, there are two fours, but three twos. Three twos and five numbers total. Yeah, and if you don't live in the U.S., it doesn't work right. Nope. So then you should just go to homebrewedchristianity.com. That's right. And boom. There you go. Guess what? You get the. But this the, is a free course. We should we should mention. Yeah. If, in case we didn't, I yeah. can't remember. It's free. And the other thing we're going to do for it, because I've been talking to some people that have already signed up. Uh, when you sign up, you'll get a little email that asks you one question, uh, and I'm not going to tell it to you for it it's right now. It's a secret. And then we're collecting all the responses, um, and then uh, we're going to be using them to help shape the nature of the class. Plus, we're going to be building out um, a, a, a Facebook group page. For everyone that goes through it, so everyone's like, oh, you know, I had some ideas on this, or I have some curriculum I made on this. Because when it goes to youth ministry, there's uh, not a lot of curriculum for people that aren't really conservative evangelicals. <laughs> uh, and, the, and a lot of mainline Protestants and a lot of more progressive people, when they're working with youth, deal with very different, uh, but a lot of the same problems. So uh, we're also going to set it up where people will be able to share um, insights, materials, ideas. So you could say it's like an open source, open and relational. Ooh. <laughs> of course. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. Uh, anyway, yeah. So thank you uh, for, for joining the podcast today. Here's some ingredients. It's called Daniel Kirk and I talking about Jesus. If you like this podcast or the Lectio cast or the Culture cast or the Theology Nerd podcast or the Barrel Age podcast, um, if you like it, then tell somebody, review it on iTunes, and if you want to support it week to week, then go to homebrewedcommunity.com, and you can uh, become a, a member, a member of the homebrew community. Donate each month, keep the podcast going, and give input, be a part of reading groups, secret groups, all that kind of stuff. This month, um, everyone in the group got delivered to them uh, the, the Theology Nerd Boot Camp I did with John Cop. What? Oh, Yeah. And next month, I have a, I have a special uh, a special uh, little treat for the members. So mm. uh, just get on it now. Be prepared. Be prepared because uh, you know it's it's nearing Easter, and you got to get prepared for something to happen. That's right. Daniel's probably going to talk about that because don't want to get his book's about Jesus. But I and know. also the Lectio cast. Yeah, you can't really dodge <laughs> those texts. <huh? laughs> All righty, here he is. Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. Guess what? what? Daniel Kirk is on the podcast. Woo-hoo! That's right. The man, the myth, the legend, the person I managed to talk into starting a lectionary podcast uh-huh. so that he can fill up your ear pipes, your biblical imagination as you start to work on those sermons. Ah, yeah, that Daniel Kirk. He's also the author of a brand new book, which I'm sure you've all already purchased and given five star reviews on Amazon. But if you haven't, Today is your opportunity. That book is called A Man Attested by God. And this isn't an autobiography, though it could be. This is a book about J.C. Boom. Oh, yeah. You have to put your initials in on Amazon. J.R. Daniel Kirk. Yeah, well, I mean, the important thing, you said it's not an autobiography, but it looks like it kind of could be the way they did the cover. It says J.R. Daniel Kirk, A Man Attested by God. Uh, Mm -hmm. So... Oppose the thesis of this book at your own peril. Oh, well, well, well. Uh, and, and here's the thing. Like, if you were talking about an oppositional thesis, this book, uh, which need not scare you just because it's 600 pages, um, this book is, is, uh, a bit oppositional. Um, you're gonna, you're taking, you're taking on a number of the very trendy, uh, New Testament scholars, early early church kind of theologians, um, around the emergence of a high Christology rather early on in the church. So uh, maybe before uh, before digging into my stack of questions and my three very very big concerns I have about the book, because when my Jesus book came out, you had three concerns. 
um, uh, why don't you set the stage? So if, a, if someone is picking up this book and, and is like, what do you mean this new high Christology thing and now you're arguing with it? Tell, tell, tell the baby Bible nerds uh, what's happening on the SBL block uh, that sets the context for your book. Okay. So, you know, it, the story used to be that you would, you know, you would grow up reading your Bible and you would see things where it's like, oh, look, Jesus is son of God. That means he's divine. And then, or, you know, Jesus is uh, Lord and that means he's divine. And, oh, look, there was this Old Testament passage that said Lord and it referred to God in the Old Testament and they applied it to Jesus. That means Jesus is God. Um, so, yay. Uh, so that's how you would, that's how you would read the Bible in college. And then you would go to your, uh, your introduction to Bible class and they would say, no. And, uh, Was you, that with a German accent? No, nine. And yes. And th- they would start opening up the idea that, you know, son of God is something, uh, a way that, uh, you know, an old Testament person might've talked about a king or, um, you know, the idea that you, when you quote the Bible, it's in this new context and it's talking about something different. You can't just bring, you know, all of the meaning in and read into this context. And so, um, it, you know, the idea that used to be that um, in critical scholarship, that there was a, a development in the Christology of the um, the New Testament. In particular, that there is a, quite a distinction between the Christologies of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are very much concerned with Jesus as a human, um, it, though, of course, reflected through the post Easter resurrection convictions of the church and the gospel of John, which ha- begins with a, a pre-existence Christology uh, and, you know, get the, the, the image of Jesus as God striding about on the earth kind of thing. You may be hovering six inches above or something like this. Um, but what's happened over the past 20, 25 years uh, has been an emergence of uh, early high Christology in scholarship. And uh, there's been a couple of different ways that this has been approached. Um, uh, often what happens, uh, I think a regular way to approach this is um, where folks will go, okay, in early Judaism, because of their commitment to one God, because of Jewish monotheism, there are certain things that you can own that are only true of God. Uh, and then they, they turn to the New Testament and early Christian writings and say, but you know, New Testament writers the earliest Christians said, or these things about Jesus uh, as well. So Larry Hurtado uh, talks about worship and the, the whole, the whole orb to worship gathering as you know, being predicated on God in early Judaism, but then shows how Jesus um, fills these roles either, but you know, songs are sung to him, then they, he, you're baptized into his name, you share the meal in him. So all of those defining elements of worship are uh, around Jesus. Um, even though, you know, Jesus is also depicted as divine agent. Um, uh, and then Richard Balcom came up with a, a, a larger list um, where he talked about how um, only God is spoken of as creating the world and having so- exercising sovereignty over it. Um, only God bears the divine name. Uh, only, only God receives worship and has people bow down to him and the like. And so, um, Balcom's title, uh, for this is divine identity Christology. The idea being that the way an early Jewish person would, dem- would talk about, um, Jesus being God without using that ontological language, um, the way that a Jewish person would depict what the creeds did in a in a Greek idiom is by telling a story in which somebody else played the role of God, um, taking God's exclusive actions uh, to themselves. So um, Balcom's thesis especially has gotten a lot of traction and the idea of Jesus sharing in the divine identity has been a regular way that folks have uh, approached this early divine Christology. So um, in their wake, there've been books by Simon Gather, Cole, Kevin Rowe, most recently Richard Hayes has a book uh, where he, on the synoptic gospels where he, He's building on um, actually two books on the Synoptic Gospels, where he's building on Bauckham's work. N.T. Wright, in his work on Paul, has also recently adopted this divine identity Christology idea. So there is what I have called an onslaught of early high Christology. I've been accused of using martial imagery and you know m- making this whole thing into a knife fight and, and all the rest. Uh, 
um, mostly because uh, I think there is there is this tidal wave of movement in an early high Christology direction. And my book wants to say, not so fast. Not, not so fast. Now, the uh, as a as a scholar, you have a whole host of reasons that um, you know the the, the arguments uh, you see kind of failing and where they're missing and that kind of thing. Um, as a as just a member of the academy in the church, do you have an idea of uh, of why you think the these type of uh, theories have become so popular and persuasive uh, in, in, in at least, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, but from what I've read, they became popular and persuasive almost exclusively with people of faith. Like I, I was trying to think of a popular Jewish new Testament scholar. Who's like, that's right. And I didn't see gaze of Vermesh like published, you know, or, or like Bart Ehrman reads it goes, Oh, that's, that's a bit, um, a bit odd for you. Yeah. Um, so can you, can you describe kind of like how as a scholar and a person of faith, these type of issues get, uh, entangled? Yeah, I think it's really tricky. I, I would say, um, just to your last point, Daniel Boyarin is somebody who has, is a Jewish scholar who has advocated for an early high Christology, um, even in the gospels through the son of man sayings. Um, so I, I engage with his work as well. It's really the son of man sayings being like, uh, for people who don't know, those are like going back to Daniel and kind of late Hebrew scripture apocalyptic uh, writings where the son of man functions in um, some type of divine role. And in, in, so he's arguing that it is this higher, more elevated status. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, so, uh, so that's out there. Uh, you know, it's. I've struggled with this quite a bit and, you know, I, there was a review session in my, um, on my book at SBL and I basically brought this up that it was, there are two people who are reviewing it. One of whom is a Christian who's an early high Christology person. And the other person, uh, was, um, from, who taught New Testament at Virginia tech for her whole career after you know, doing her training at Florida state. And she was like, well, you know, I wouldn't have written this book pretty much because it's just what I've been teaching in my classes for the last, you know, 35 years. And the people Daniel's arguing against basically read the Bible like my freshmen do when they come into my class. And, uh, you know, I don't, I can't take their work seriously. Um, and, and then the other person is an early high Christology person who's like, you know, why, why are you being so grumpy? Why isn't it both and or, or whatever. Uh, and from the audience, there was definitely pushback on the idea that the, the opinions on my book were related to faith, um, the faith posture. But um, I think that the New Testament guild has been struggling with how to do theology from the biblical text for a long time. And I think it's part of its struggle has been embodied in, in the fact that it's, it, you know, the kinds of historical questions, the kinds of historical questions that New Testament scholarship was asking in terms of when it start, first started doing form criticism and source criticism and redaction criticism. Uh, and then as it's trying to get you know, to the historical Jesus and historical Paul and these kinds of things, um, I think that it definitely left a, a sense among Christian uh, New Testament scholars that historical scholarship doesn't have a lot to contribute to the theology of the church. Uh, and so there's also in Perhaps not coincidentally, in the same time period that there's been this rise in early high Christology movement, there's been a rise in, um, uh, there's been an emergence of a theological interpretation of scripture discipline, which, um, in its worst instantiations, um, and a growing number of instantiations is basically the creeds teach us how to read the Bible. Um, to which I want to say, if you want the creeds to teach you how to read the Bible, there's a discipline for that. It's called Christian systematic theology. But our job is to is to engage. Yeah, I think it's a historical discipline to read the Bible in its historical context and ask what might a the the Jewish writer who wrote this, who within the first chapter, within the first six verses, directs you to the Old Testament as an interpretive conversation partner. How might that sort of hermeneutical landscape of Jewish person who believes someone is the Messiah, who's, in, who's asking you to read in conversation with Judaism and its interpretive traditions, how might they have, what, what kind of story might this be for them? Or how might a 
somebody who had never heard the creeds be hearing this, you know, to ask those historical writer reader questions, I think is a, I think that's a vital contribution to the theology of the church. So, you know, my sense is that when the, when I read something and I'm like, okay, Christian theology says Jesus is divine. Fine. Let's not, let's not question that. Not everything in the Bible teaches us that. I'm okay with that. And then I want to say, okay, if this is a human Jesus, my confidence in scripture is such that I think that we might learn something about Jesus that we would not have learned otherwise if we come with our Christian theological grid. So, you know, there's, it's all well and good to say both and, but the reality is that when a Christian comes with the presupposition that Jesus is divine, that conviction overruns everything else. Uh, and I, I feel like this whole early divine Christology movement is giving people too much permission to read these texts as describing a divine Jesus and our impoverished theology about Jesus and his humanity and, and the place of humanity in the biblical story is simply um, being exacerbated. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that um, one of the things that, that you spend quite a bit of time on in the book is the individual synoptic gospels and the Christology uh, that they're proposing and where the way they engage different um, parts of first century Judaism, the way they appropriate scripture and things. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of people might find it helpful for you to tell, uh, kind of, like sketch how we got to an early church that wrote gospels as a, liter a literary answer to the question, who is Jesus, right? Like it, it, to read the way you read them means these are not just like reports. They are rather sophisticated pieces of literature communicating um, a, an interpretation of the life and history of Israel, the meaning of Jesus's ministry, and ultimately a me the meaning of his death and resurrection for the community who would identify these texts as gospels. But there's a, when you're dealing with, history, you have the historical Jesus and what it meant for him to be him in his historical context. Uh, whatever happened to all those stories and the practices that built up around it in the early church prior to ever writing the uh, gospels that we have down. So how did we, like, how do you, how do you see that whole process from, you know, historical JC to a uh, multiplicity of gospels uh, uh, playing out? Yeah. Um, you know, I'll say that I don't really consider myself a scholar of Christian origins. And I think that's actually the frustration of some people who've been reading the book is that I, I'm, I'm trying to drop down and engage the gospels and ask and, and try to assess them as an isolated piece of data. And some folks are saying you can't do that, um, because there's this other stuff out there, like Paul's letters and whatever that show us, you know, divine Christology from early on. Uh, and and I, I intentionally don't answer that question, uh, much to some people's frustration. Uh, uh, let me start with the end point and say that uh, I do think it's critical that we recognize the Gospels as literary productions. And you know, despite what Augustine or Origen or whoever might have said about their their low literary quality, and, and you know, in some ways that's true in terms of the Greek and those sorts of things, but as narratives, they're actually very well written. Um, and Mark, which has gotten the least respect of all, um, the, the more you get into it, the more you recognize that it's very carefully crafted and structured. Uh, you know, just to give a couple of examples, um, you know, Jesus is only called son of God by someone other than a, a demon, um, three times in the book, twice by twice by a divine voice and once by the Roman centurion. Um, it's at the very be the first time we meet Jesus at his baptism. It's at the transfiguration, which is at this turning point in the book. And then at the crucifixion, which is the last time that we see Jesus in the book, beginning, middle and end, all marked by Jesus being declared son of God in some sense. Uh, and then there's uh, in Jesus conflicts with the, with the Jewish leaders. The first conflict is the healing of the paralytic where he's accused of blasphemy. The last time he's in conflict with the Jewish leaders is uh, at his trial where he's accused of blasphemy. Those are also the first and last time that we see the phrase son of man deployed in the book. So this is a very carefully structured uh, and crafted sort of thing. Uh, it seems to me that they're they're written uh, in part probably because there's a need. Um, people have been preaching Jesus for uh, 
a long time, um, probably 30, 35 years bef- before Mark gets written. Um, some of it may just have to do with the time and, and the generations that the first apostles are probably starting to die. Um, some of it ha- probably has to do with geopolitical factors. Mark was written on the cusp of the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, and so, you know, the idea that you've got this central, you know, early church from Jerusalem, that's kind of the, the core, you know, from which, you know, if you're going to have that kind of, that kind of narrative is not going to be sustained. Um, you've got, uh, I think you've, you've got churches in different places. Um, so, you know, there's, there's been, there's been Jesus talk, uh, and the Jesus talk has been interpreted. It's also been written down. Mark had, um, written sources. Uh, and, um, so, you know, people are wanting to, people are wanting to tell, write, tell these gospels so that they can tell their story of who Jesus is. Uh, I think one of the most helpful things for this uh, with my students that I do is just have them look at the beginning of Luke. Luke says, okay, now a bunch of folks have written stories about Jesus. So now I'm going to write one to make sure that it's all put together the right way. Um, you know, so what he's saying is I've done research. I've got, I've got Jesus stories, but I don't want to just give you the Jesus story that I've received. I want to tell you a different story uh, about Jesus. So I think in a very real way, it's a, uh, it's stories that are preaching the life of, uh, that are preaching the life of Jesus. Um, one, actually, one of the interesting things that, that came up at the review session, um, uh, Larry Hurtado was on the panel and, and you know, he's an early high Christology guy. And as we got into it more and more, uh, I think I basically got him to fess up to the fact that the gospels are written as simply talking about Jesus as a human figure and not as a divine figure. And he, he said, yeah, I think that the gospel writers felt the same pressure that you seem to feel, which is that they're in a world where Jesus divinity is being accented to such a degree that they need, they need to go back and reground the story of Jesus in the, the life of the human in Galilee. Um, so, yeah, like, and I, that I, pressure I, itself is something the church felt the first four centuries. Like if you go look at the Christological controversies, despite people wanting to read the creeds back into the Gospels, when they called a controversy into a council time, it was to take sides with the full humanity of Jesus. The church regularly, it would get popular to like to like abstract some part of Jesus out to make him not really fully human. All the will, the mind, the soul, whatever. And the church is like, nope. Now they had some really weird answers. To, they're, like, I'm not a huge fan of using Greek philosophy to explain the person of Jesus. But what they held the line on is, no, 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 Jesus is straight up fully human. And, and I know you might get excited. You sing too many praise songs at church, uh, a little too much communion wine, and next moment, um, he doesn't have a human will. Well, we're going to go back. And, and so the, the, I, I had an argument with a friend of mine who may have gone to the second best, third best, now probably fourth best school in the ACC in the state of North Carolina, um, about, uh, uh about, about your book. Um, and I said, Daniel's just doing what the councils did insisting that God was made flesh and that uh, the humanity part, we got exactly how the divinity stuff works out. We don't know. We're just going to keep talking about it. We'll keep figuring. And now he's just saying that we should take seriously the gospels we canonized, that they insist Jesus was fully human and they don't even agree. I was like, he is the most conservative biblical scholar to come out of Duke because Duke put too many theologians in their Bible department that then Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't get to talk anymore. He just thinks that they should have their own voices preserving diversity and multiplicity um, of, of authentic uh, pre-creedal confessions. So, I don't yeah, know. You know, I, 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 one thing I do keep coming back to is the uh, – there's this great line in, in E.P. Sanders of all places where he says, you know, the creed says that he's like – he's human like us in every way except sin, not in every way except the ability to walk on water. Uh. <laughs> oh, Ed Sanders, like, bring in the, the creedal responsibility to New Testament scholarship. Um, but, uh, yes – and and I think you know re- engaging that question and like forcing us 
us to hold on to that, that these are not stories where you can go, well, the reason he can do this is because he's divine, right? Like, no, this is even in, in the you know, Orthodox theology, he's the God man. So what does it mean for the human Jesus to walk on water or to raise someone from the dead or to feed 5,000 people? Um, so, you know, I think that there are Christological implications for that. I also think that there are ecclesiological implications for that because once we've said Jesus can do these things because he's the man, the human one, then we can't escape the question, what does it mean for us to be followers of Jesus? What does it look like for us to participate in this fulfilled humanity of which Jesus is the first instance? Mm -hmm. Well, and even in the Gospel of John, where Jesus got, has, uh, he, he's more of kind of the globe trotters of the Gospels, um, where you already know who's going to win from the very beginning because, right. well, this is the Word of God. Um, but, uh, in the, in the, in the garden, they're like, Hey, where's Jesus? He's like, I am boom. And they fall to the ground like a yeah. good Pentecostal rally. But, but even in that gospel where you have these signs that are, that are all over the top, that's the, also the gospel where Jesus is like, y'all are going to do greater things than this. Yeah. And in one of the things that I think kind of attending to each gospel in its own voice and even attending to like that part in John is that we have a tendency to want Jesus to do all the work so that it outsources the responsibility each person of faith has as a disciple. But when you look at each gospel individually, even that part in John, John's going like, you impressed? You think he's divine because he did some miracles and junk? Now you're going to do greater things. The gospel of Mark has a, you got this apocalyptic text Half of it's about the cross, and it's all built on your own, the, the story of the disciples being called to this same kind of fully fully giving oneself to the moment and God's coming in there. Like, to, so to me, there's a, uh, when our biblical scholars in the church engage uh, the text and then end up with something that justifies our kind of disengaged discipleship rather than our full engaged one, which the gospel writers themselves are trying to articulate in different ways. Uh, I think we miss uh, some of the point. Yeah. And I mean, in some ways it's a, uh, a sort of uh, reformation theology gonna run amok, right? I mean, it get, the, the farther Jesus is, the more it's him for us rather than us doing, the more you can you know, kind of settle into this, okay, faith alone, it's not my work, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. And the, especially with, you know, with Mark's gospel, you know, it's so, it, it's so clear. Like Jesus does, what does he do? He goes out, he preaches, he heals, he exercises demons. He calls the disciples to be with them and to be given a power, authority to preach and to exercise. And he sends them out and they go out and they exercise and they heal and they preach. And the, he goes to feed the 5,000 people and he says, you feed them. And it's not, it's not a bait and switch to show them that they can't. If you read that story, Jesus actually doesn't feed the 5,000. The disciples feed the 5,000. He breaks the bread, puts it in the hands of the disciples and the disciples are the ones who take it out and give it to the, give it to the people. So like in that first half of the gospel, that's defined by all these awesome works. The disciples do what Jesus does. Then when the, the thing takes its turn to go to the cross, like, okay, here it is. The single most unrepeatable thing that Jesus does. This is Jesus for us, the liberating act. And the first thing Jesus says to his followers after predicting his death is, hey, everybody, come around. If you want to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. So you know, even the cross itself becomes a defining marker of the life of the people of God. It's about the humans. And Jesus is not just here to say, look, God can do what you couldn't. He's here to say, you know, when the reign of God comes near, you can become a different kind of transformed spirit empowered humanity. And the way you know that is because Jesus is present as this different kind of transformed spirit empowered humanity. And he's calling his followers and showing us in them that they can do the stuff that he does as well. Mm hmm. So there's a couple of things that I maybe we'll, I want to ask them, but we'll stay in Mark. So that way we don't have to jump gospels. Um, but uh, can you describe for me when, uh, how you understand uh, Mark, Mark's, what is Mark, what does it mean for Jesus to be human uh, in the context of first century Judaism, this idealized human, like what, 
what is Mark wanting to communicate about Jesus uh, in in the historical context? Yeah, well, what I think that the humanity does is it creates, I think it creates an important point of continuity with the whole biblical story, which is that the way in which God is at work in the world, making God's self known, um, reconciling the world, the kingdom of God, the way that happens is always through God's chosen people on the earth. Um, so uh, I'm going to go theological right now rather than, than Mark. This is my, this is my big theological conviction is that, um, when the stories of Israel say that when God creates the world, his purpose is to have a faithful humanity ruling the world on God's behalf. Genesis 1, 26, 27. That's also, I think, son of, child of God language, the image and likeness thing. So to have children of God ruling the world on God's behalf. Israel is supposed to do this. Uh, end of Deuteronomy. You know, you're going to keep this law and the nations are going to go, whoa, what nation is there that has a God so awesome as you that, you know, uh, the, it has these great and righteous laws that you have in, on your presence and you're going to flourish and all this. That is Israel making God known through the ordering of the world according to God's desires and um, that being the, le- the leverage through which the blessing of Abraham comes to the nations. They F it up. David, um, the king who is supposed to be the son of God who rules the world on God's behalf. Psalm 2, right? Um, the Davidic king is anointed and he says, I'm going to tell the decree of the Lord. He has said to me, you're my son. This day I've begotten you. Ask of me and I'll make the, the nations your inheritance. So, you know, this Abrahamic promise of land and all the people coming under the blessing of God, it's supposed to be mediated through this child of God who rules the world on God's behalf. And that's the covenant promise in Second Samuel 7. Uh, I'm going to be, God said, David, I'm going to be a father to your son and your son will be a son to me. Uh, so uh, with Jesus coming on the, the stage as a human agent and um, you know, Mark begins the beginning of the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, maybe the son of God. There's a text critical issue there, but this is the, the fulfillment of the story of Israel. Just like God said, you know, prepare the way in the wilderness. Here comes Jesus as the Lord whose rule mediates the presence of the heavenly God. God's purpose to have a human agent, a a beloved son, as he'll say at the baptism, anointed as God's going to anoint him by the spirit, empowered and faithfully ruling the, the, the world on God's behalf. That's what's happening in Jesus. So with that framework, what I want to say is what Mark's trying to communicate is that God's promise to have a faithful human king rule the world And that be what the kingdom of God looks like, that God is going to set the world to rights, but the way it's going to happen is through the mediation of God's faithful people, that that moment begins with Jesus here. When the, the, the satanic demonic forces are subjected to the power of the human one who's been given authority on earth. When people's sins can be forgiven by the authority of the human one who's been given authority on earth, when broken bodies can be restored by the authority of the human one, all of this is a picture of God fulfilling God's promise to have um, a Davidic king who's going to make the holistic life of God's people and all the people of the earth um, flourish under God's own rule. One of the things that uh, in the Gospel of Mark, there are three different elements that you, well, there's more that you talked about, but this is a long book. But three of them that, uh, what you did with it kind of stuck out to me is uh, how Mark frames the way you understand Jesus's eschatological vision uh, and the role Jesus as exorcist and miracle worker play uh, in that. Can you uh, can you say a bit about that? Because I think that our conversations around the kingdom of God uh, and this kind of talk and our uncomfortability in a kind of post enlightenment world about exorcisms and miracle working uh, really sets us up to be kind of uh, not so wonderful readers of those elements that especially Mark drive it. Like he doesn't have near as many teachings as the other gospels. Right. Um, can you say a little bit more? You, you introduced with some eschatology. What, what were you? Oh, like how Mark understands or, or presents Jesus kind of eschatological vision of the kingdom of God, it, it, all the debates around apocalyptic or not. And, um, and, and that kind of thing. But when the role he has as an exorcist and a miracle worker tied to um, it, the way you, you describe the kingdom of God and it's. Sure. 
Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, you know, uh, one of the most important things that I try to do in this book is to continually tie these Jesus traditions into their e- either biblical or post-biblical Jewish precedents to, to, to indicate ways that what Jesus is doing um, people have done before or the Messiah was or somebody was expected to do, you know, when the the end came or, or when the f- time of fulfillment came. So, you know, I do draw attention to David's own role as an exorcist uh, that when he was uh, after he received God's spirit, or he, he would play his harp for Saul and the evil spirit that tormented Saul would leave him for a time. Uh, and in the early Jewish tradition, uh, Solomon also was imagined to be an exorcist, and they, we've actually found exorcisms in Solomon's name uh, in early Jewish texts. So the son of David uh, is thought to be uh, an exorcist. Uh, and so, I mean, what, what you're seeing in, in these kinds of texts is that the person that God has empowered by God's spirit to rule over the world is empowered over not only the humans on it, but all of the, the spiritual elements that, that come into play in, in, in the way that the, the world is. Uh, so you, somebody who has the spirit of God, uh, has authority over these foreign spirits, uh, that, uh, might suck the, the life and health away from, from God's people. Um, uh, part B, uh, in, in a lot of, um, not just early Judaism, but ancient worldview, um, the spiritual and physical were not these hermetically sealed, uh, ideas, mm-hmm. uh, and people's bodies being broken or sick, uh, would, you know, that would often be seen as a spiritual ailment uh, as much as a, as much as a physical. So Jesus as healer and Jesus as exorcist are, uh, are related ideas. So Jesus in this text is coming as somebody who has this authority to exercise and to heal. Uh, I, I think Mark makes it pretty clear precisely because he has the spirit of God. And this actually becomes the point of conflict. So there's this um, controversy that's called the Beelzebub controversy, where Jesus is accused of having, uh, being, casting out, uh, demons by the prince of demons. And, you know, basically the, the, the way Jesus sets up the option is, well, either it's by the prince of demons or by the spirit of God. And if you assign the work of the spirit of God to demons, you're guilty of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. You're never going to be forgiven. Um, so, you know, here's the, here's the tension. It's not between is Jesus present as God incarnate to, you know, take his stand against the, the equal opposite force of evil, which is Satan and Satan's minions. It, uh, maybe what part of what the story is saying is no, actually God is bigger than that kind of dualism. So God's agent empowered by God's spirit can actually stand here and, and play that role because God made humanity as the, as the pinnacle of this world, as the ruler, the right human, the rightly empowered human can stand on it, can um, act for God and can even serve as the, the final judge. So uh, when Jesus saying the reign of God is being brought near, that reign is present in him. And the nature of that reign is being shown as existing not just over broken bodies, but also over these spirits that antagonize and um, steal life from the, the people of God. And he stands as Lord over the, the systems, the social systems that steal life from uh, the, the people of God and, and from humanity. Um, so, yeah, those are some of the, the, the ways that I see this story playing out. Let, let me give a, an, a, just a little bit of an illustration from early Judaism. Uh, in early Judaism, there's this text called The Life of Adam and Eve. It, it's a, a text in which they're basically, somebody's telling a story uh, to try to understand why is it that Satan would want to tempt Adam and Eve to disobey God. So the, in the story, what happens is, God's got all these cre- these angels and they're awesome and they're beautiful. And then God makes humanity, Adam. And God makes Adam in God's own image. And he looks so much like God and God is so proud of himself, of God's self in Adam that he commands all of the angels to bow down and worship him. And, uh, and Satan says, no, 
I'm not going to do that. I was here first. Um, he should bow down and worship me. Uh, and so that's that. And so then Satan gets booted from heaven. So the reason Satan gets booted from heaven is his refusal to bow down and do obeisance before the human. And what I love that story is I, I feel like it, it kind of gets in and scrambles, uh, some of our assumptions about the, um, the great chain of being, uh, where we, you know, we're not medieval, right? But we still have this idea that it's God, then it's and angels, and then it's us, and then it's the animals, and then it's the dirt. But what this, what this story shows is a way of thinking about the universe where it's God, and then it's humanity, and then it's angels, because humans actually bear the image of God. So these things we're seeing Jesus do are a, a restoration of humanity to this place of almost indescribable glory in the order of God's creation, and that Jesus is uh, exercising these judgments now is an indication that God's world is being put back together in the way that, uh, that God wanted it to be all along. Mm-hmm. And, and um, so one of the things I, I, I think has kind of really impacted what, what we under, or at least how we understand the gospels in early church uh, thinking about Jesus has been the rather large growth in in the last hundred years of our understanding and the attention we pay to first century Judaism, uh, especially to texts that aren't in, in scripture. Like you just mentioned one, um, but there are tons and they play an important part of the book. Uh, And I wonder, you know, I could imagine someone sitting there, you tell that story and they're like, yeah, but in the real Bible, it says um, that we, you know, we're a little lower than angels that's in there, uh, Daniel. And there's a reason that heresy text, uh, of pouting Satan, um, wasn't in the Bible because God didn't want it in there to mess with our theology. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, I, if you, if you were trying to describe the, uh, the, uh, uh, Divin- the fluid notion of divinity uh, for first century um, Judaism, and 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 what was at play religiously in that discussion? How would you how would you characterize it in light of the more rich texts and resources we have? Uh, I would say this is. I think that this is the big surprise for people. The scriptures and early Jewish traditions will articulate things that belong to God and God alone, whether it's God's name or God's power, God's authority, God's glory, right? And all of that, it does. And one of the ways that these same texts will show us that somebody is God's agent is to demonstrate that God gives this thing that nobody else can have, God nonetheless gives that to somebody else and they embody that category in God's name on God's behalf. So uh, that's the, the invitation of this book is to recognize that God's possessions, um, God's descriptions, God's attributes are more fluid than the absolute statements we'd make. And I think what I try to show is that you see this Yes, in early Judaism and its interpretations and appropriations of the biblical text, but you can see it in the biblical text themselves. Example, the Exodus story. God calls Moses and God says to Moses, you know what your job is going to be? You're going to be God for Pharaoh. Now, your translation might make be like, I'm going to make you like God to Pharaoh or something, but no, I'm going to make you God for Pharaoh. And then... Okay, well, that's fine. He's God's agent, you know, but it's not like Moses gets to then deputize somebody else. Moses to God. Well, God, I kind of don't want to go talk to Pharaoh because I, 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 I'm not really good with my words. You know, I might trip on it. Fine. I'm going to, you're going to be God to your brother Aaron and Aaron's going to be your prophet and you're going to put words in his mouth. So Moses plays the part of God. Uh, in this story, because you know, well, there's only one God, yes, and and then and it's and God lets Moses be God too, um, and and then as the story goes on, you know, God is the one who afflicts Egypt with all these plagues, right? Well, yeah, but 
so does Moses. Um, you know, God, Moses has to act. And in, in the crossing of the Red Sea itself, you know, God says to Moses, lift up your staff and part the waters. Uh, and so Moses has to lift up his staff and then God parts the waters. And at the end of it all, after it all happens, the writer tells us, and the people put their faith in God and in his servant Moses. So you, you go through that story and it's a story of God being incarnate in the person of Moses and Moses being the revelation of God. Um, and, you know, so the invitation of this book is to allow ourselves to recognize the, the breadth of meaning possible to say God is with us in this person or this person is here to be the embodiment of God in the salvation of God's people. Uh, there's, there are a lot of people who did that. Uh, maybe not a whole lot, but there are a number of people who, who played just that role, um, in this, uh, in the story of Israel. And, and, you know, the Old Testament stuff can be the thin end of the wedge so that when you get to something like Qumran and they're rewriting scripture and saying, and they're applying to, um, like the teacher of righteousness, a text that originally was about Yahweh, you're like, okay, that's a little weird, but you know, Moses says, I mean, um, Philo said that God made Moses God and king for the whole nation. So, you know, that's what Exodus says as well. Um, these are people who are actually participating in the way that the Bible itself exalts the particular people at given times and places that represent what I call idealized humans figures, the people who are like quintessentially everything that you would hope humanity might be. So if, if someone's hearing that and be like, all right, maybe, 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 but, but what, what makes Jesus unique, particular and distinct? The first most important thing is his particular mission that he is the Messiah whom God anoints by God's spirit to be the fulfillment of God's promises to the people to reconcile humanity to God's self. Uh, and as the, the, the head and king of this people, he also then empowers his followers to, you know, as John puts it, do greater works than these. But he opens up um, a new way of being in this new era of God's people. Uh, Jesus is the Messiah, and that is a unique role that he plays uh, in these stories. It doesn't mean that he's just another guy, but the way in which he fulfills his mission is by this um, humanity. I mean, just to take another, uh, I mean, just to, to take a crass example. If I were to say Michael Jordan is a man and not a God, who's going to come back to me and then say, well, then what makes him different from any other basketball player? Uh, he's better than everybody else who ever played the game, right? He, he has, there's a reason why everybody is compared to him because he is like, he's, when it comes to basketball players, he is the man. And what I'm saying about Jesus in the Gospels is when it comes to being human in the way God wants us to be human, he is the man, which is something nobody else has ever done. And the way that he fulfills that mission, we get hints of, is in a way that overcomes what hinders the rest of us from being ideally human and ushers in this new era of human possibility. So one of the things that um, that uh, at least what theologians argue about new, with New Testament Christology stuff, uh, one of the the kind of uh, pushbacks have gone back and forth has been uh, what of all of the kind of different symbols for thinking ab about the divinity and person of Jesus in uh, Scripture you kind of center your reflection on. And historically, the church, not that long after... Um, he got going, Logos Christologies became very dominant. Mm -hmm. um, and now I, I, I know in one sense, John really wasn't doing everything people later thought John was doing uh, with the Logos, especially once you put it in kind of first century Jewish context and stuff. But I think there's one sense that the Logos kind of image, it when it gets personified and then it gets hypostasized, where there's something other than God that was present in in Christ, 
you have this like logos where God's being mediated and it's by Jesus and it's this other thing. Well, it's the sun. We'll come up with a way to hook it up. Uh, but it's something other than God that was present that we then call later fully God. If you kind of trace the story of logos Christology, I'm wondering if that, if there's a, if, um, like what, what kind of what image or symbol would you kind of be more drawn to? Um, a lot of theologians have turned towards developing what they call spirit christologies, uh, and you know there's a variations of them or whatever. But uh, in in hopes to avoid both this distancing of God from God's presence in Jesus uh, and people encountering God in in Jesus, and also to avoid this uh, um, locking our christology in to a conclusion that then silences all the other gospels and their own uh, uh, contributions. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, before I directly answer your question, there's one thing you said in there uh, where you're saying about the Logos being something other than God and, and all this. And um, it, it, it raised for me what's actually, in my mind, the most important reason why I wrote this book, which is in the Gospels, as well as Paul's letters, by the way, Jesus and God are separate characters. And when we try to make Jesus God, we create problems for the stories that the stories themselves don't have, uh, that these things actually read much better. Uh, right? The cry of dereliction, why have you forsaken me, is not a problem for the Gospel stories. It's a problem for divine Christology. Um, so, uh, I mean, the, the most important reason I wrote this book is because I think a human Jesus is actually makes a, for a better reading of the stories we've actually been given. So that's well, it, would you would you uh, um, better than Bart's Trinitarian reading? Better than Bart's Trinitarian reading. Full stop. <laughs> um, so, uh, so you don't think that, uh, um, Mark or, or Matthew or Luke? Uh, when they're reading around the the understanding of Jesus, um, how would you describe their their what to have encountered Jesus? How have you encountered God, or how was God with us in Jesus? Maybe that's a, a way of thinking about it. Like, and I think that's the theological uh, the theological question that the church gets hung up on that mm-hmm. then it attaches itself to the logos. Um, yeah. is in what way is God uh, with us in Christ? Yeah, um, I think the, the big answer to that question is God is with us in Christ by um, executing God's saving reign. Um, God is with us to, to save us um, from the, 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 the life-sucking reign of uh, what in the, the the stories is depicted as this um, spiritual opposition of you know, the satanic power, um, enslavement to sin and death, and and the consequences of sin, uh, also in um, slavery and, and other sorts of things. Um, you know, the uh, God with us. It's um, Matthew cites that uh, for from. Isaiah 7. And so I always think it's interesting just to go back to Isaiah 7 and say, what did God with us mean then? Uh, What it meant then was these two kings that are bearing down on Jerusalem aren't going to conquer Jerusalem. God is God is with us, so we will be delivered from these guys who want to rule over us and crush us. It doesn't mean that God is going to be physically, you know, physically incarnate in a special way in this in this newborn child. And you know, to me, that that opens up the, the idea. He's going to be called Emmanuel. Why? Because he's going to save his save his people from their sins. So the saving the God is with us means that the saving presence of God is here. God is at work to redeem, to rescue God's people through God's promised Messiah. Um, and I think you know, other things that people can say with the divine Christology, I would say about Jesus as a fully human. Like if you want to know what God looks like, you know, God is a, or God is a verb, a verb that acts like Jesus. I think that's completely true. If you want to know what God looks like, you look at Jesus. I think that's completely true. Why? Because my controlling um, Christological image is Adam Christology. Uh, and what does image and likeness mean? It means if you want to know what God looks like, look at people, look at humanity, because that's you're in this Genesis one thing where God is creating this cosmic temple. Um, what goes in the very middle of it is not an idol, 
uh, an icon made of human hands, but the icon that God makes God's self that says, this is what looks like me. And I'm going to put it right in the middle here. Um, so, you know, in this, um, priestly tradition, humanity is a divine theophany. And so like, that's, that's the Adam Christology that I think makes sense of Jesus in the gospels, where you see somebody who is in what he does is so faithful to the identity of God, the righteousness of God, the power of God, the justice of God, that this is, um, this is God present with us in the human who finally looks just like God to a certain extent that even incorporating him into the divine worship isn't blasphemy. Mm-hmm. Now I, 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 you're talking to a process person, so this is not super scary to me. I'm still wondering exactly why you like Carl Bart at this point. Um, it, it, uh, he would be very concerned by, uh, by what you just said. Look, if you're a, if you're a new Testament scholar and, the theologians aren't concerned about you. You're not doing your job. <laughs> the, uh, um, one of the things that I think, uh, it, or one of the ways I've kind of phrased, like what's revealed when we get anxious about talking this way, right? Like, it's not like you're compelling everyone to agree with you. You're going like, here's a giant book with lots of footnotes. You should think about it, take it critically and see what goes on. And a lot of the pushback that people have, at least on the internet is so theological it's unrelated to whether or not you're accurate right which is, which is kind of funny right. um yeah i mean because, there's a guy who reviewed it who actually said i'm not going to agree with kirk because if his idealized human christology thing is right you'll never be able to get divine christology back into the synoptic gospels uh, actually i don't think it's that hard but the the it is funny right that that's that's the response and and I think where the anxiety comes from isn't theological. It is actually kind of unquestioned philosophical commitments people have after the Enlightenment. The, the idealized human, Adam Christology, all these things ask this question about how God present in Jesus and all this stuff. And underneath it is this assumption that just like that stupid track people hand out with a giant gap between God and them, and you need a little cross to cross it, they imagine the world's that way. That God is somehow outside of the world and that Jesus, the incarnation, the deity of Jesus is the vessel by which God finally arrives on the scene rather than Jesus's divinity or the man attested by God, his idealized human is actually the product of God who'd never left us, forsake us and has been a full participant of history's realization of God's investment in the history of Israel, in the life of Jesus. It's a conclusion of a story of God's identity being revealed in an other. And that yeah. you could say things like Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That's not crazy. Um, but it's not an image that came in like a, like a lightning bolt and broke through. It's an image that's actually the fruit of the vine of David, the covenant with Abraham and Sarah. It's God's ongoing relationship. I think that the, th- the thing that drives me, or that really frustrates me when people freak out for their, theological reasons, not dealing with the text, is what if right here you have Matthew, Mark, and Luke grabbing the church by the shoulders and going, oh, my God, like literally, you're freaking out about canonized New Testament Christologies, and the reason isn't because you deep down hope Nicaea sticks. The reason is because you would not want to have to take ownership for your life before God if God was fully present and active and alive in the world and that you were called to participate in that in the same way Jesus was. And so you need to keep God out of the world. And now you're going to freak out and tell us that this doesn't count as divinity. It's in the freaking Bible. It counts as divinity because my name's Mark. This is my buddy Matthew and Luke's back there. And uh, Luke's most cocky. He has an intro that says the others of us aren't right. Jesus and Matthew is a little more Jewish than the others. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, we're all pretty sure that God did not have to intervene and break the nature of the world up to show up. God was already present with the world. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's we will sit in a college classroom and mock the deus ex machina ending of a Greek comedy, right? Like, well, you backed yourself into a corner, can't figure out how to get out of it. Oh, the God will come down on a crane and save you at the last minute. It's bad drama. Um, but that's what people want from the Bible. And I think it's bad drama. Uh, and I think we've got better drama um, in this 
in the idea that these stories uh, can can continue from below with God working from below as God had said God was going to do and to bring salvation that way. Um, you know, I will say this, um, to, to argue that we have stories of Jesus that are not, that don't give evidence of a divine Christology that function on the level of a human Christology, I do think that it opens up the idea of the plurality of possible Christian belief that to a degree that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. I think a lot of folks, you know, you get C.S. Lewis's liar, lunatic Lord argument and what he means by Lord is God. And I think you know, this is how a lot of people feel like if he's not God, then he's just the world's biggest liar. Um, oh, I know that's a great book idea. It, it is liar, lunatic or just plain awesome. Um, so, uh, <laughs> available right now. Um, but I mean, what if, what if the earliest Christians thought Jesus was the Messiah? Full stop. And what if that's enough to be part of the baptized people of God? What if the, you don't have, what if the first conversation you have with a Jewish or Muslim person doesn't have to be the Trinity? Jesus is God. You know, what if you could actually have a conversation about Jesus as Messiah that didn't have to include Jesus as God in order for somebody to be a full participant in the Christian community? What if, what if Nicaea isn't that which all Christians have always agreed on for all times? Like, I do think that there's a possibility for a broader conversation that I actually think would be a fruitful conversation that I don't, I'm not bent on the idea that Jesus is God is the most important thing we have to say about him. I think Jesus is Lord is the most important thing that Christians have said about Jesus. Uh, and that there are ways of understanding how that identity plays out. Um, so even though I do maintain, um, some of my divine Christology credentials, um, I do think this opens up the, I think it might say to me, Okay, that's great. And you should still be able to worship with somebody who thinks that Jesus was the Messiah but wasn't pre existent. Mm-hmm. And and I and I think what you're what you're arguing for is the possibility of the church having at least as big a diversity in its Christological confessions as the New Testament. As the New Testament. Right. Like, like we're not asking you to put the Gospel of Thomas and the Q document on the list. Those are teachings. Uh, the Gospels are way more than a set of teachings. This isn't turning Jesus into a guru. All the right. Gospels are ones right. that call him the Christ, right? In some way, and and I think part of it, it, it I mean, it's connected to that absence of God, but it's also misunderstanding uh, what a confession of Jesus as the Christ means. Like right. to do Christology is something that disciples do. Other people don't do it. When right. you identify Jesus as the Christ, it's not like uh, uh, similar to a logical syllogism's conclusion, but more like that moment a boxer shakes their head just to discover they're in the middle of a ring and they just got stung. It's in the middle of action. And like Mark captures that so well. Like say Jesus the Christ is in a conclusion where you're like – uh perfectly counting your colored beads by a vetted group of very impressive scholars. But it's yeah. like a lover who like realizes that the reality of the love they have is so, so deep that they would rather risk their life, become vulnerable and hurt to be a part of what just sees them. And they want to seize it back. Like Christology, because it's not a universally applicable conversation, um, then I think, we need to recognize that it's completely valid for someone to say, uh, like, uh, who do people say I am? You can answer it. Elijah, a prophet, an outlaw, uh, a wandering cynic sage who was notorious at practicing open commensiality. Um, but all those conclusions are possible verdicts that are, you know, given the evidence. But what the evidence never gives, the verdict cannot be demanded that this is the Christ. The Messiah, this response isn't evidential, and we don't have to make this crap up by being a liberal. We just have to believe Jesus, who said to Peter, my dad told you when he said you were the Christ, son of the living God. And that response of faith isn't evidential. It's existential. It's not demanded. It's gifted. The response of faith is 
is something that it, it, it's really an affirmation that in the middle of contingent existence, the uncontingent, or in the middle of the finite world, the infinite has become present in some way. And in this narrative, in these symbols, in these stories, we try to talk about it this way. But it's that encounter that is the act of faith, I think, really problematizes us um, wanting the gospel or, or history or the scholars to line up something that goes, Jesus is the Christ. But the gospels themselves, and why I think your book was uh, is so powerful, it's going like, no, all four gospels begin with dudes who thought Jesus right. was the Christ, and right. that's nuts. The only reason you don't think that's crazy beginning premise of this entire genre called gospels is because you hang out at church too much. <laughs> but if you just took a little bit of perspective, calling Jesus Messiah is crazy. And everyone in the Gospels who called him Messiah misunderstood what the hell it meant. <laughs> Peter gets the word right, gets the content wrong. And guess what? They're not telling the story because Peter figured it out later, became Pope, and oversaw a creed. It's because we, too, can make the confession, give ourselves to Christ, and then our own life wants to say, Jesus, me and you should not go to the cross or Jerusalem. That's what Christology is. It's a discipline that is about discipleship, not universally verifiable uh, ob- obligatory truth claims and i and i think this type of academic work that you're doing really attacks the uh christendom the uh authority that church leaders want to have to protect their conclusions and it asks us to actually to engage the living dynamic of faith uh in the world and uh sorry i started ranting no but um, no, i mean you brought it right up to my enneagram eight love language challenging the the powers of the world and you know inviting no. everybody and it's man I, I love that stuff keep it coming you know i uh, as you're you're talking one of the things that you know occurred to me that yeah you know, a way that i try to engage this is if when i say jesus is human if the only thing that you can really get your head around is that i'm saying he's uh, a wandering cynic philosopher, then you need the book. Like, because that's, I'm not doing a historical Jesus thing where I'm trying to say, in order to be really human, we have to strip away these stories that we actually have and find a Jesus behind it. I'm saying, no, if we want that these stories are telling us what a true humanity actually is. So these are, you know, supernaturally infested narratives of, uh, of the life of Jesus. And it's just that narrative that I'm wanting us to explore as a, as a testimony to Jesus as a certain kind of person that lays hold, uh, or that creates a demand for a certain kind of personhood from us as well. So w- when you're, um, w- when you're working through this book, and I know you've been working on it a while, like what, what was the the biggest surprise to you uh, as a scholar? Like, what was the conclusion you you did not anticipate mm-hmm. when you're you know you're going back through the third or fourth time to uh, to read through? I was not expecting to find so much in early Judaism that paralleled so much of what we see in the Gospels. When I started, I started on a guess. I started on a guess that. Given that humanity is created to rule the world rather than angels being created to rule the world, that if I looked at a different set of data from what, say, Richard Balcom looked at when he developed his divine identity Christology thing, if I looked at how people were depicted, I was guessing I would find people depicted doing all of these awesome things, being, being depicted in all these awesome ways in early Judaism. And what, what I was surprised at was just the extent to which that was true. I didn't expect to go to Qumran and find at least three different examples where a human has been, has replaced Yahweh as the clear referent of an Old Testament citation. Um, the year of Melchizedek's favor, um, in, uh, you know, for Qumran, loving Qumran Melchizedek in, in Qumran. So, you know, those, those kinds of things that was surprising in, in a, in a pleasant way. Um, I, I wasn't, I don't think I, well, I mean, I, I guess I was disappointed, surprised at how broadly I found new Testament scholars adopting, um, the divine identity Christology sort of paradigm without doing the work in early Judaism. Um, just to see how broadly folks were adopting that and adapting that. 
Um, so, I mean, in, in terms of like my research that, that was going on. Um, and, uh, in, in terms of reading the gospels themselves, uh, you know, I, I think that, um, I, when I got through Matthew, I had a little bit more of a, yeah, there could be a, you know, maybe, maybe there's a way of thinking about, you know, how Jesus would be divine here. Um, and actually what do you make of that one pat the passage in Matthew, you know, that one section where, where it sounds like, so John, mm-hmm. I can't, it's, you know, it's in the teens somewhere, I think. Yeah. Um, no one knows the son except the father yeah. and those whom the son chooses to reveal him. Um, I don't think, yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, I know that's a popularly reference point. Um, yeah. when NT Wright was on the podcast and I was, uh, suggestively critiquing such, uh, early high Christologies that so were so compatible with Greek philosophical commitments, the church mm-hmm. had yet to really encounter much. Uh, the, the, like that section in Matthew is like the, uh, was like the, the anchor for hooking all sorts of conclusions that are connected to, uh, um, not so Jewishly exegeted Pauline hymns and Johannine, uh, Christology. Yeah. I, I, I have a, a couple things to say. One is, I think it's very, because we associate that with John, I think it's very difficult for us to get our minds around other possible interpretations that don't depend on preexistence. Uh, there are other things, other early Jewish things that I think are helpful. I think, um, you know, the idea that, you know, depictions of, of an anticipated Davidic king who, because he's taught by the Lord, would know, would be able to, to read the hearts of people. You know, these sorts of things where there is this, connection between the anticipated king and God, who is his father, who he knows um, through studying the Torah and by having the spirit um, that, uh, you know, provide alternative context for this unique knowledge between Jesus and God. Um, there is even Matthew's own, um, own Moses Christology, where you have this figure who is specially enlightened about the will of and identity of God. And in that same place where Jesus immediately goes on to talk about being, um, uh, inviting people to him, taking his yoke upon you, and he's going to give you rest. Um, you know, the idea that Jesus is filling in for Torah as the yoke that you take on yourself, right? This is the gift from God that, that makes God known. Um, to the people. So I, I think that there are other, um, for lack of a better word, images and metaphors than divinity or preexistence that can help us get hold of a lot of these high Christology passages. Mm-hmm. Well, um, maybe two more questions. One is, um, this year, the gospel is Matthew for the lectionary. And uh, you know, a lot of the gospel texts are going to be uh, right out of the Gospel of Matthew, and one of the challenges I think for lectionary preaching is, you know, you're getting texts that are theologically connected because of the church's conclusions much later, and um, a lot of times you have the challenge as a preacher to to introduce, like how how would you describe people getting in a mindset to introduce Matthew's own voice when engaging the text rather than um, using Matthew as an opportunity to espouse uh, uh, the conclusions the minister has or the tradition or the creeds. Yeah. I, I think that for all of the gospels, I, I think it takes a heck of a lot of work to spend enough time with each of the gospels to recognize their own voice and their own theological concerns and in a more than just surface sort of way. Um, so, you know, I, I do recommend, you know, read through it and I'm mean, not to be too big of a dork about it, but read through it with Matt, with Mark or Luke alongside, not to say, not, don't give the sermon where you're like, and look how Matthew changed 42 different words, but use that to make you a better reader of Matthew to, to say, okay, you know, I don't know if Matthew used Luke or not. But the way that they shape this one story is so different. And it, in each one, 
it demonstrates the um, it demonstrates the the unique theological concerns of this reader. So I would suggest reading them side by side, not and again not to harmonize because that's not the point either. Um, so um, spend time with Matthew alone. Spend time with Matthew contrasting him with the others. Um, uh, read a man attested by God. In fact, one of the reasons why everybody needs this book is because the lectionary has you in one of the synoptic gospels every year. So you need to, you know, you need to get your head around those things. Um, look at, uh, and then, you know, obviously, you know, good commentaries are, are good commentaries. You know, sit down with Davies and Allison. It's, I know it's pricey, but if you, you know, if you're using it every third year to, for your Matthew preaching, then, you know, it's, it's an investment. But you know, I, I really think you can't do better than studying the text yourself and whatever tools you can use to help you understand and get your head around Matthew as a unique story. I think that the better off you're, you're going to be. And that it's just, it's, it's a discipline of listening, a discipline of listening to a voice and just asking yourself, is he saying what I think he's saying? He just used this phrase, son of God. Now I know what that means in the creed. But what might that have meant for a first century Jewish person? Son of David is important for Matthew. Um, does the fact that he's called son of God here, uh, how is that, how does my understanding of that shaped by the fact that Matthew uses brothers and sisters languages to talk about Jesus followers more than any other gospel, right? Maybe we share in this son of God thing that Jesus has. Um, I, I would, yeah, those are some some approaches and some some questions and suggestions um, for uh, how I would how I think about it, um, and also to to say it's not an easy fix. Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, last question is: uh, Tell us what Daniel Kirk is up to these days, and uh, different ways for people to connect to gauge your work, um, and uh, may, maybe if they're in the Bay Area to connect with you uh, in person. Right. All right. So I am doing the LectioCast lectionary podcast, as I'm sure you know. So that's probably the best way for you to get your mind around what's going on in Matthew. That's not just what the church wants you to say. Is listen to go to LectioCast.com and do that every week. Um, I have started poking around on a book that's going to be a, hopefully a more popular um, version of Human Jesus and Why It Matters. Um, but my book poking around has been kind of sporadic lately. Um, I am working for the new begin house of studies in San Francisco. I'm working with a fellows program. So if you are in the Bay area, we, um, each fall, we start this thing. It's a nine month intensive in theology, Bible and spirituality, including, um, justice and, you know, hot topics like sexuality and what that matters for the church and all that. So um, that is a great thing. Uh, it's meant for lay people. Um, it's a really, if you're a pastor, the fellows program is a really great training ground for your church leaders. Um, get them into some theology, get them thinking about how to read the Bible and how the, the justice movements of the church um, should be integrated with those things. So you can go to newbeginhouse.org to check that out. We also have monthly things where we're going to have Miroslav Wolf here in a little bit. We're going to have Sarah Miles out. So um, that is definitely something worth checking out. Um, and, you know, if you're in the Bay Area and you're, you're really just desperate for community, I help lead a house church too. So you can uh, reach out to me and I'll let you know about that. Um, and yeah, I blog sometimes at Storied Theology. So I, I try to, you know, make myself um, profligate around the interwebs for your Bible theology and Jesus following goodness. Well, and, and clear, clearly, if they're saying themselves, I should just have Daniel come talk at my church or my school or whatever. Yep. They should contact you about it. Reach out. That's right. Daniel at jrdkirk.com or, you know, you can find me on the web. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, hanging out on the internet and uh, talking it up. Um, and uh, I, I look forward to whenever we get to, to do it again and see each other in person. That's always my favorite. Yeah, it's not as much fun um, drinking beer together at 10 a.m. via the internet.